Welcome to edition 51 of All Killer No Filler podcast with me, Rachel Fairburn and Kira Pritchard McLean. Just before we start, we'll do our usual disclaimer. This isn't hero worship. We do this podcast because we have mutual interest in serial killers. And as long as we are doing this podcast, it stops us from writing to them in prison. Whee! <laughs> it's very weird to do that without people joining in now. I know, now. I know. Just, you know uh, but lovely I, I love touch. how it's become more laboured over the... It's like, I get to the end of the night, I have to <gasps> take another breath. Oh, is it? Yeah. I, well, you're just grinning all the way through it these days. I find it amusing, I don't know why. Yeah, you've got the giggles about it. Uh, so this is episode 51, we're doing Peter Tobin, uh, mm-hmm. which is sort of related to our last podcast, which is Bible John, yep. but we shall get to that later. We shall. Um, we uh, would just like to take this opportunity to say thank you very much to everyone who came to see us in America. We had a fucking great time. Absolutely loved, no, wasn't a shit show there. We loved them all. Had a great time audiences were delightful delightful really nice because they're like people we were meeting after us were like thank you so much for coming as opposed to when are you coming to derby <laughs> um so yeah we had a we had a really nice time and we we're really excited uh it's just made us all get all giddy about doing the shows at christmas here and like met, met, met some of you, lots of you afterwards you're all lovely the lovely ladies that we met in boston, boston from liverpool for, yeah the lady from liverpool she was mm-hmm. great she was fantastic. With the daughter they'd come all the way from atlanta i think yeah and yeah, everyone was dead dead nice. Girl we met in Salford, also met her in Boston. Yeah, she'd moved to Boston, hadn't she? Girl who spoke Welsh to me at uh, New York. Couple of gay guys, absolutely loved those. Oh, they were great. Uh, what Sugar was Cookie Sugar and Cookie, Fuckface, yeah. loved them. Um, and thanks for all the lovely, we, I mean, we don't expect presents. It's always nice when you bring them. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, we had some cracking stuff. Yeah. So yeah, we've had a... Uh... We had a really cool um, key ring and shot glass from the Overlook Hotel amazing. from The Shining. Although my keys have gone missing, so... Oh, that's very, sad. very upset. I should give you mine, but I won't. No, I, would I, like never, I wouldn't accept it. It is too cool. We found out as well that where we were staying in downtown LA was really close to the Hotel Cecil. Yes. Which is where Richard Ramirez um, did some of his, you know, schlapping about. Mm-hmm. And where that girl, that poor girl a few years ago, had like a psychotic episode and drowned herself on the roof. Horrible. Yeah, it was really scary, that footage of her in the lift that's absolutely terrifying. And there was another person who used to knock about there back was in the it, day. Um, oh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Went there, Black Dahlia, didn't she drink? Yes, at the, yeah, that was She it. was drinking at the bar. Yeah, so we were really close to that and didn't realise we would have made a request to stay there had we known. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we had a really great... Also, I was really struck by L.A., how like thoughtful all the questions were afterwards oh very much so yeah. um because like <laughs> love it but in new york they're like oh, what's your favorite drag queen <laughs> and in la they're like what is it like being women in male dominated industries <laughs> which is like a great question to answer um so thank you everyone who came along and supported us mm-hmm. and made us feel very loved we we yeah we're very very grateful thank you and thank you to the like nearly a thousand of you who bought tickets to our amazing extra christmas shows because yeah uh, London and Salford were sold out and there was big waiting lists so we asked you guys and you said it was alright to put on other shows and we did and uh, London sold out and Salford's very nearly there as well mm-hmm. and so I would book really soon if you can uh, yeah if you wanted to come to Salford that's it basically uh, I just want to say a special thank you to the lady who gave me that bangle that you put booze in when we were She's in great. San, yeah, Francisco, San Francisco, because I forgot to tweet it. I, I was actually looking at it before, and I thought, like, I'll, I'll, well, actually, I can't tweet it, because I've been banned off Twitter, which we'll get to in a minute. And it was, um, what's the word? I wanted to Instagram it, and I totally forgot, but I just didn't want it to go unappreciated, because it was lovely. Yeah, I've got a matching one. Mine's a yeah. different colour, though. It's great. It's a hip flask and a bracelet, so no one will ever know that you have a habit. <laughs> Um, yeah, so basically we had a really nice time. Thank you so much uh, for coming along. Um, Peter Tobin. Peter Tobin. Born. It didn't have any... It didn't have um, uh, a, nickname. a nickname. We're going to try and come up with him at one over the show. Yeah. He was born the 27th of August, 1946, in Johnston, Renfrewshire, in Scotland. He had up to 40 aliases, though, that he gave himself. Yeah. Various uh, different names. He was a, His job was a handyman. They think he joined the French Foreign Legion at some point, but deserted. But that's unsighted. <laughs> uh, he was born into an Irish Catholic family. He had four sisters and three brothers. Uh, yeah. He had a, he was described by one of his brothers as a bit of a wild child. Uh, well, yeah, because he was, like, second of eight kids, but by seven years old, he was already in reform mm-hmm. school. So, I mean, to be seven and not be able to be sort of, like, mainstream educated mm. is pretty 
Well, a bit wild is an understatement, I would say. Yeah, I used to work with a guy who, years ago, who never used to go out, never used to do anything. And it, he used to always get my surname, Fairburn, wrong and call me Fairchild. <laughs> and then, because he used to go out quite a lot, I was like 18, 19. And he used to, he used to say, um, oh, here she is, <laughs> wild child. I'd be like, what do you mean? Well, <laughs> Fairchild, like, that's not my surname. No. It doesn't work. <laughs> just doesn't fucking work and also wild child just, just can't really be attributed to somebody who just goes out yeah. like a normal 19 year old can it <laughs> his uh, dad was a council worker and his mum was a housewife mm-hmm. um, apparently he had a, quite a poor relationship with his parents but he was described as a loner but a bit of a charmer as well yeah because we're talking about this that he went we'll talk about it later obviously but the women that he gets with very quickly like get into committed either marriages or relationships yeah. with him. So although he's, you know, like a wrong and he must have something about him that he all be able to switch it on, certainly. He was described as very well-dressed and he used to enjoy visiting dance halls um, at the time, which was quite a popular thing. He, he spent some time at an amateur football club called Thorn Athletic where he was sort of marginally successful. He did receive several sentences as a sort of a juvenile for petty theft and forgery. But nothing that would suggest... I think forgery is such a charming little crime, isn't it? Yeah. Faking who... notes and that. I was with... So, you know, John George Haig, mm-hmm. that we've done live a couple of times. Have we done it? We've done live. I was, I was just out... I was at my friend's house the other week, and I just looked at the TV for four seconds, and uh, it said uh, he was uh, a very... A consummate forger. And I went, John George Haig. My mate went, that's incredible. I went, what? He went... You've just watched two seconds of a TV programme, heard that, and you know it's about John George Haig. was like, huh, what a catch I am. <laughs> <laughs> what a superpower. I can't wait till you're on Celebrity Mastermind. <laughs> See, I'd love to go on Celebrity Mastermind. I imagine it would be the Gallaghers you would do. Can't do it. Our good pal George Lewis, a uh, comedian, lovely guy. He did Oasis as his, uh, top, his subject on Celebrity Mastermind, and he won. You can't do it twice? I don't think they'd let you do the same subject oh, really? twice. No. Is that what you... Well, you'd have it'd to have pick to be, something else. It'd have to be Oasis. Uh, well, you just pick one of them, don't you? You do Liam Gallagher. Yeah, but I don't want to come across as weird. I can't... What if so he's do watching Noel. and he's... Yeah, but then Noel will be like, who's this weird woman? Maybe... Oh, I don't know. What could I do apart from that? Famous sets of siblings of Irish descent. Of Irish descent. The cause. Just eight <laughs> the questions cause. on the cause. The Gallagher's bewitched. <laughs> <laughs> um, where were we up to? Sorry. So... We're talking about his upbringing. Upbringing. So he manages to... I mean, he's quite popular with women. He's not, you know, repulsive. So he had a 17-year-old girlfriend um, that when he was 24 years old. Well, they met when he was 22 and she was 17. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like, what she says is that he was very charming to start and then he got violent. Mm-hmm. And this is Margaret, right? This is Margaret Mountner, yeah. Mm-hmm. So they, uh, she was a typist and sort of admin assistant type work. And they, on the 6th of August, they got married eventually. But in 1969, after his abusive behaviour was obviously getting out of control, he um, attacked her. Yeah, so... He'd been chipping away at self-esteem and he started to not let her go out and he was holding a hostage in uh, their house. Yeah, and he used to beat her up and she came home once... And this is horrific, strapping. Uh, he'd found that she had cut... He had cut the head off her puppy. Ugh. Which is just horrible. A huge warning sign. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> not like a... Oh, and that was my first red flag. Like, that's a get out of the house. It's not yeah. safe. Speaking of puppy, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, adopting a rescue cat, which I'm very excited oh, about. Yes, you went, are. went over the other day to meet the cat and... The reason why it reminded me of this is not because of that. And they cut my head off, and I think, fingers crossed that they'll like it, <laughs> um, is that uh, her dog was great, the woman who's fostering him at the moment. So I was making fuss of the dog, and I was saying, oh, what breed is it? And she said, oh, my dog's a Bichon Frise, and he's half Bichon Frise. This one was Charlie that was sat on my lap. And she said, and the next one, they've got Jack Russell, and it's half Jack Russell. I was like, oh, I see what's happened. But I looked in the garden, it's a fucking massive fence, like six foot high, well, not six foot high, but high, about the same height as me. And uh, I was like, oh, right, how did he get in? And apparently the Jack Russell bounced on the children's trampoline from next door 
and trampolined himself yeah. <laughs> over the with his boner over the wall and then fucking stuck it to the Bichon Freeze. It's, it's, it's mad. I imagine this dog as a, a dog version of friend of the show, Will Duggan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's the exact kind of thing that he would do. In fact, you've just missed friend of the show, Will Duggan. He's just been, he's staying at my house because he's best mates with my fella. And uh, yeah, they're just going out. In fact, they've gone to the pub at the end of the road. Which so I'm very upset about. <laughs> you're f- absolutely fuming that I they've not really gone with you. I feel really left out. <laughs> they've taken a pack of cards, so it's not going to get too wild. <laughs> um, yeah, so he then assaulted her with a knife. Mm-hmm. He also raped her. And and it's so brutal was this attack that she was found by a neighbour only because the blood was dripping through the ceiling, wasn't it? Yeah, so the so flat they... below had blood dripping into their flat and it was from her. But what he had, without being too graphic, but basically he had used this knife on her and she inside her and yeah. she can't have kids. Like, she, that's yeah. just done. Also, she was in a coma for three weeks after this attack as well. Mm. Now, obviously, she was terrified of Tobin. She had that. She she felt like she was too scared to tell anybody about what had happened. And when she was released from the hospital, she was released into Tobin's care. Fucking hell! And he decides, well, we can't stay in Scotland now. I'm going to move her away from everyone she knows. I'm going to take her to Brighton. He's a monster because also she's a kid. Like she's 17 when she gets him. Like do you think about those relationships she had when you were younger, and you were like, oh, this is normal. You know, especially because you have loads of like internalized misogyny that you're like, women are mad. Women are that. You know mm. that you just believe about yourself, and then having someone do that and just have no support. No, oh God, it's fucking terrifying. She, like, it's not that she'll think that's normal, but she won't know how abnormal yeah. that is. Yeah. Poor fucking kid. So he goes to prison, doesn't he? For, yes, uh, for theft. For theft. He gets five years, he only serves three, and in that meantime, she fucks off. Yeah. She bolts. Good for her. Yes. Uh, 1973, this is when he's released, he meets Sylvia Jeffries, who's 30 years old, she's a nurse, and they get together... And they have a son called Ian and a daughter called Daisy. Now, Daisy dies very soon after uh, she's born. Now, Sylvia and, so far, Margaret, and is sort of onwards, every woman he becomes involved with, he starts to get angry when they are having their period, doesn't he? Yeah, so he's, he's generally described by most of them as being violent, manipulative, and having a huge... Like, flying into a rage when he finds out that they're ragging. Which you'd think he'd be pleased about, because that's like, yay, we don't have a baby again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, but something about women menstruating... Sends him into a... Sends him into a rage. Which is one of the things that links him to being Bible John. So, in 1976, she left him. She took their son and they went to a women's refuge. And she'd kept a, a diary of all the abuse that she received from him. Yeah. And she gets a lifelong injunction against him, doesn't she? Which, yeah, I, th- I feel like that must be quite a feat to get. So basically he wasn't allowed to contact her or approach her for the rest of his or her life. Which I feel like that, what must have been in that fucking journal? Horrendous. To, to make that happen. Although I would, I, I kind of like the term lifelong injunction. I'm going to end friendships with that. <laughs> like... Take this, not a friendship breakdown, it's a lifelong injunction. Nice, okay. I like it. I've never heard of one before. That's really full it's, on though, isn't it? Yeah. Again, he's got a radar for the vulnerable, because he meets Kathy Wilson, who's 16. She's living alone. This is in 1986, 1986. isn't it? 1986. She moved in with him in September 1986, and very soon afterwards she becomes pregnant, and they have a son in 1987. In 1990, they moved to Bathgate in Scotland, which um, we will talk about Bathgate uh, a bit more later on because something happens there. Uh, but uh, a friend of mine, uh, Fern Brader, stand-up comedian, I texted her the other day to say that I was like, oh, I've been reading up about Peter Tobin. I've uh, been thinking of you because she's from Bathgate. And uh, <laughs> she said to me, aye, Peter Tobin. I'm not going to do the impression. It's she- a great impression. Hey, Peter Tobin, right? He's the reason I had a luminous whistle on my school bag. <laughs> She's like, my parents thought I was next. <laughs> <laughs> but all this was happening in, like... So they got married in August 1989, and they're over here in sort of, what, like, yeah, basically 1990. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess she would have been in school then. Yeah, yeah. she'd have been quite little, yeah. Yeah. So she... um. 
And obviously, remember, we're going to get to this bit, so the girl that goes missing was missing for many, many years. Yeah. So people are probably thinking... You'd think it was somebody that lived where you lived, wouldn't you? Definitely. And he was then it was with Kathy as well. He was violent. He was controlling. He wouldn't let her leave the house. Um, once she wanted to leave him and he got their baby, Daniel, and he <sighs> dangled him over the banister and was like, I'm just going to let him drop if you try and leave me. We did that classic thing of, oh, if you leave me, I'll kill Daniel and then I'll kill myself and you'll have to watch it. I wouldn't say it's classic, mate. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's not cla- Dancing Queen, is it? <laughs> it's classic controlling male yeah, behaviour, yeah. isn't it? It's horrific. It's, that, it's like when, and you know, of course women do commit horrible crimes, but by and large, it's usually men that go, oh, I'm in debt, so instead of dealing with it, I'm going to kill my whole family. Or like, oh, she's going to leave me. I'm going to kill everybody. We, I mean, we are slightly biased when we're in America. We watch loads of those, like, <laughs> families who kill thing, and it was always guys in debt who, you know, then just killed everyone. It's, it's predominantly... I'm not saying women don't do it, but it's a predominantly male thing. Uh, and I, I'm not afraid to say that. I'm tough shit. You should be afraid, mate. It's men that kill us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... She, in April 1990, she saves up in secret bus fare. And um, so she fucking, he goes out. And it got to the point where she he was coming with her to go in the garden. He was coming with her when she went out to the car to, like, unload it with shopping. So one day something happens and she fucking pegs it, takes Daniel, goes to the bus station and is saved up this bus fare to get a ticket to England. And she said that waiting for that bus was like the longest 45 minutes of her life. I mean, the fear of just Ugh. thinking he's going to come around that fucking corner and he's going to kill me. It's one of the few times a bus stop is mentioned on this in a, a positive way. Yeah, really. that's true. I mean, don't get me wrong, it goes back the other way because there's a, there's a bus stop murder later on. So, yeah, she ran away with Daniel and then someone told her shortly after that, oh, just so you know, he, he overdosed. He tried to kill himself on um, Amitab... Uh, Amitipitline. Amitipit... How do you say that Beautiful word? Beautiful language you're learning uh, <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> I'm going to write it out because you won't be able to read my handwriting. Amitip... Amitipoline. Amitipoline. Yeah, Amitipoline. I shall call my first daughter this. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes Amitipoline. Now, it, the interesting thing about this drug is it's what he uses to drug two girls with mm. later on in the story so Kathy fucks off she moves to Portsmouth which is where she's from she's going back to her family yeah because that's one thing he did was like right let's move her away yeah. and he moved her fucking miles away from her family to isolate her And but Tobin just follows her in, in, he, he does well he Kathy says that she never felt that Daniel was in danger with Tobin which I've well, she knows best. She knows best. It's not up to us to say. And he moves to be nearer to Daniel so he can spend more time with him. And on the fourth of August, nineteen ninety-three, uh, two teenage girls, two fourteen-year-old girls, they, he's living at a place uh, called Lee Park in Havant. And these two fourteen-year-old girls, they go to call for a neighbour who wasn't at home, so they went to Tobin's house and asked if they could wait in there. Now Daniel is at Tobin's house. It's his sort of time to to have him. And the two girls go in and he forces them at knife point to drink uh, cider and vodka. He drugs them. And da- bear in mind, Daniel's there. Daniel's five years old and he stabs one of the girls and he makes Daniel go and get some ice so he can put it on the girl's wound. Fucking hell. He phones Kathy. He says, oh, I'm very ill with heart trouble, which is a common feature that keeps happening. He's a hypochondriac as well as everything else. He said, I'm very ill with heart trouble. Can you come and collect Daniel? And she's like, of course, yes. Yeah. So she goes to collect him. I think she actually asks him if he's all right and My God. see how he's doing. And he, I think he says, oh, I just need a bit of a rest or I need to go to the hospital. And what he does, after he's raped and attacked these two poor girls, he turned the gas tap on in the house and left them for dead. Jesus. Now, he does a runner. Yeah. Which, again, is a common feature with him. Yeah. So he goes and he hides in a religious retreat in Warwick under a fake name. Now, so this is another reason why he's linked to being Bible John. So for a start, apparently he looked like the mm-hmm. uh, sort of e-fit sketch of Bible John. Uh, Bible John was quoting bits of the Bible. He always hides in religious places, Peter Tobin. And there's the thing about hating it when women are on the rag. Yeah. So he's uh, he's hiding in these religious sects. And the reason he's found is partly because of Crime Watch, the yes. now defunct TV program. Is it defunct? Yeah, because you know what? They fucked about with it. 
You know, like the raffle car in Father Ted? Right. Such a specific reference. Brilliant episode. They win a car and a raffle. There's one dint in it. They tap, 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 tap away at it. They ruin the car. That's exactly what they did with Crime Watch. <laughs> a programme that you used to look for. Mike, do you know what? The only bonding experience me and my father really have is watching Crime Watch. Really? That's pretty much it. That's pretty much it. World's Strongest Man is what my dad and I used to... And, and Formula One, we used to watch that together. I mean, my dad and I get on very well. Do you like Formula One? Um, I used to... Yeah, I used to follow it. I do find it quite boring. It's quite long. Um, but yeah, it was it was all right. My dad used to sit on a... When my mum was going out working in old people's homes on a Sunday, he'd be there smoking in the house, which he's not allowed to do, <laughs> watching the Formula One, smoking, smoking, smoking. My mum would get him and be like, you were smoking in this house? No, Beverly. <laughs> It no, I was smoking by the door earlier and the wind blew it back in if you if you have to know. <laughs> it's quite clearly the tyres on the television yeah. thing you'll find. But yeah, and World's Strongest Man. I used to fucking love World's Strongest Man. Well, that's it, Crime Watch. That's the only programme me and my dad uh, really ever watched together. And now it's gone. People's Princess, Jill Dando. Now it's gone. She was Crime Watch, wasn't she? Was, was it? Yeah, yeah, she was, yeah. yeah. she was. Uh, if, you, if you love a conspiracy theory... That'd be an interesting... Look up the Jill Dando one, yeah. mate. I'm obsessed with that. Have I mentioned... So, I must have mentioned it on this podcast. So, the day Jill, da- Jill Dando was murdered... I definitely mentioned this. We should maybe explain to uh, people who aren't yeah. based in Britain. So, Jill Dando was a really popular Very television popular, presenter. Yeah. Weirdly, she died... Did she die about a similar time to Diana? Because I know she looked like her and there was loads of kind of... It was a weird thing that uh, was kind of swept up in I think that it Diana. Was just after... From what I can remember, so she, yeah, she, but she was looked sim- similar to short blonde hair, really attractive journalist, uh, very respected, very warm. I think mm-hmm. she used to present like the odd, like like a place in the sun or something as well, or something yeah, like all that. different kinds. Of yeah, it. and uh, she was pre- she was most famous for Crime Watch, which I guess you have in America and Australia and places as well, where you like uh, there was a robbery on a bank and the person had a very distinctive tattoo on their eye or whatever. And so she was assassinated mm-hmm. outside her house yep. one morning. And did they find the person who did it? Well, uh, there was a chap who was a bit of a, a peculiar... That was it. Uh, so like a Lee Harvey Oswald. Sarah, wasn't it? Yes. Who was obsessed with Freddie Mercury. Yeah, that is Freddie Mercury's fr- fr- yeah, real Sarah. name. Yeah. Yeah. And he was sort of accused of this, but I think it was he was found not to have been him. And they've never found out who actually murdered her. Um, but the day that it came out that she was murdered, I was in school, and uh, in its very, very early days, the text message, when none of us really used them, uh, Martin D- <laughs> who's in my class, who I was ma- madly in love with, a bit like Noel Gallagher, got off with him years later. Well done, Rachel. <laughs> anyway, he his phone beeped, everyone went, oh, what's that? And he went, oh, my God, I've just got an alert from the news. And I was like, what? And he went... <gasps> Jan Dildo's dead. <laughs> Jan Dildo's been murdered, Jan Dildo. And I went, what? He went, uh, no, uh, Jill Dando, Jill Dando. <laughs> <laughs> Jan Dildo. Oh, oh God. Dildo. So sad. Like, we're not laughing at her death. We're not laughing at that. Jan but... <laughs> Dildo is a fucking brilliant drag name. I was going to say that would be a cracking yeah. drag queen. Jan Dildo's dead. Quick, come quickly, Jan Dildo's dead. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> but yeah, if you look it up, there is a really dark theory as to why mm-hmm. she was killed. Yeah, very interesting. Um, which we will talk about maybe at the live shows. Oh, yeah, we can have I'm sure someone gave me some little insider information on it. So, where were we? Anyway, Crime so Watch. So he's, yeah. So, so he, the, to, the Peter Tobin, well, the description of him and what he looked like because he had done a bunk appears and he gets recognised at the religious retreat, so he gets arrested and uh, taken to trial. So May 18th, 1994, he's uh, taken to trial at Winchester Crown Court. He pleads guilty and he gets 14 years. For, for, for rape and not attempted murder. Yes. Which, so that was like the plea bargain, yeah. wasn't it? So he gets let out after 10. And well, he, the judge said this was the worst case that he'd seen in 10 years. That's horrible. It's it's awful. It was two teenage girls whose lives are absolutely, absolutely ruined, ruined by this fucking monster. So 2004, he's released. He's 58 years old at this point. He's a registered sex offender. He's meant to be telling the police where he is at every given point, if he moves towns or whatever. And his family have disowned him. 
Yeah, he moves back to Scotland. He's in Paisley. And so May 07, he gets another 30 months on his sentence because he breaks the terms of the sex offenders register. Yeah. Well, and I think that's for not checking in. He also meets a, a girl called Debbie, who's very, very young. And she sort of develops a friendship with him. There doesn't seem to be anything other than that in it. And they get on and she actually describes him as, oh, he's, he's quite funny and he was quite nice and, we, you know, we got on very well. And she was actually warned by the authorities about his past crimes. So she was sort of a bit, you know, she, she sort of took a look at it and he's like, oh, you should seek legal advice because the police are lying. Luckily, she had the... Nouse. Nouse to go, hang on a minute, there's something not right here. Totally cooled sort of the friendship off and didn't really get involved. And she, Debbie returns a little bit later on uh, in this story as well. How old was Debbie? Uh, I think she's about seven, 16, 17. She's very, very young. Have you ever had that where you've had like a old, much older friend? Or so, did you ever know anyone like that? I've, I've still got quite a lot of friends that are older than me. So my, my, my friend Karen, who used to work years ago, Karen's like 63. Really? Yeah, we get on, we have a right fucking laugh, me and Karen. So there's something really dark. In my school, there was a guy who was like very, I would sort of describe as like sort of geeky six former, sort of like Dungeons and Dragons vibe, sort of like sort of benign, sort of hello, would always sort of let on. And like, I used to hang around with like, uh, from as soon as you start getting a personality, so like year nine and stuff was like, me and like the goths and the skateboarders and then by the time I was uh, sixth form it was like me and my little gang of like indie kids in skinny jeans but um, when I was sort of like younger so in that little, little what we were called goths we weren't we were skaters <laughs> but in our little skate phase he would sort of let on every now and then and he kind of knocked around with some of my friends but he was in sixth form and we were like in year nine and stuff anyway did not think of him ever again and then my friend messaged me, like, about a year ago. And she was like, oh, do you remember this guy? I was like, oh, yeah, vaguely. And she was like, he's been he's been put in prison because he had raped a load of girls in, like, really horrific, violent attacks. Because, like, where the town I went to school in was a big university town, Bangor. And he, um, there's a park that you cut through that we used to knock around in all the time called Uni Park. That you cut through to get to some of the accommodation, and it's it's like quite rural where we're from, so it's not it's not lit up at night, but it is just like quite a safe. Ta- well, it's nowhere safe, is it? But um, feels like a safe place. And he had, I think, he'd attacked three girls, oh, wow. and the judge was like, "You, we have to put you away for as long as you can because you are just a threat to women." Jesus. And it's like this guy, and then when you look back, you're like. Oh, yeah, what seems like a benign guy who doesn't get on with people in his year because he's a bit geeky is actually, oh, that's someone praying, mm. you know, you know, just like, it, well, you just look, you analyse someone's behaviour differently when you, when you know everything, uh. I guess. It's really creepy, isn't it? Yeah, it's very strange. Sometimes I can't, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think, I think yeah. it's fine at, at our age having friends that are older. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, but I think when I was like a teenager, if, I, because like when I was at school, I always used to think, say when I was in year eight, so there'd be a, a lad, it was like old Peanut, who was in year 11, he was a very Oasis Liam Gallagher type. And I used to think he was very attractive. But to me, he seemed like a grown man, because at yeah. that age, three years is... Cool. Yeah, it's massive. It's like a huge thing. And I remember once he started talking to me, and I was thinking, ew, why is he talking to me? He's like a grown-up. I, I, I'm still like that. In that uh, my boyfriend gets really annoyed with me, because I'm like, literally, you're in a different school year, and he's like, you're fucking pathetic. <laughs> I was like, you're pathetic. You're in year nine? But I find it really creepy that my boyfriend would have been in a different school year. And I also find it's weird that his best mate is a year below him, would have been a year below him. I'm like, ugh. Why were you knocking around with someone the year below you? And he's like, you're fucking 30, nearly 32. But I just find it weird. How do you think I feel at this current juncture in my life where I'm getting constantly asked out by men that are 10 years younger than me? Oh, yeah, you're getting asked out by babies, what like I, teenagers. I what, what am I meant to do? I can't sit on it, see what it's no, like. No, I, I, I don't think I can do it. Yeah. What when we talk about Pokemon? Yeah, it's come around twice, so that works. <laughs> And then this come round twice. Both yeah. times. <laughs> Tamagotchis. Tamagotchis. Did you get them? When I was your age, we used to have a thing called a Tamagotchi. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, else has come round twice? Pogs. Pogs. I feel like they had their time. Yeah, they have. Push Pops. Oasis. <laughs> There's plenty to talk about. Oh, no. Nah. Let you know again. Our on. friend Dan Nightingale used to have a great routine about, you know, all his mates are like, pulling a 19-year-old and he's like... 
I don't want to have sex with a 19-year-old and her being like, can we just watch Ice Age 3 and maybe have some Cheerios? (laughs) Ice Age 3. (laughs) That is funny. It's great. It's a brilliant comic. Where are we up to? Right, so there's there's another incident with a a lady called Cheryl who he sort of described as he groomed her and he pulls a knife on her. Now, what he doesn't expect is that, that Cheryl's been in the army and I fucking love she this. She gets the knife off him. And what's his reaction? Oh, he feigns a heart attack and ends up in hospital. What an um, absolute there's, there's dick. a lot of this. So the police get involved. And he changes his name, though, and he goes on the run yet again. And he changes his name to Pat McLaughlin. Now, this is where we come to... The church. The church. So September 2006, he's working as a handyman at a church in Glasgow. And he's going by the name of Pat McLaughlin. Um, now, he's on the sex offenders register here. Uh, he's not complying with it, so he gives them this false name because otherwise they would do a background check and be you mm-hmm. absolutely can't work here, mate. So there's a girl who also works in the church. She cleans um, She cleans there. Her name is Angelika Kluck. She's 23 years old. She's from Poland. She was staying at the chapel as well. Now, she was working there to pay for her own degree. She was doing a degree in Scandinavian studies in Gdansk. She was last seen with Tobin on the 24th of September in 2006. Mm -hmm. And then they don't know what happened, but they think he attacked her in the garage. They think... Because they they sort of got on very well and they would spend time together. He's doing handyman stuff. She's getting involved with other things and helping out. Now, one afternoon or evening, we're not sure when, they were in the garage that was attached to the church. And in this garage, there was all things like... It was like a storage area, so it would be like paint pots and various other things for DIY. Now, for whatever reason, he attacked her with, they think, a table leg. And he beat her, raped her and stabbed her. And then he dumped her body underneath. Was it the font, wasn't it? So he, no, so he hid, basically, there was a floor space in the church, that you, but a very small space that you could like lift up. And it was by the confession on both... And she was bound and gagged and he put her in there and they think mm. forensics and they found the body, which was found on September the 29th. She was still alive when yeah. she was put in the floorboards, which Awful. is fucking terrifying. So he's... Obviously, people... You know, people alert the police that she'd gone missing because it's very out of character. And that he's gone missing. Oh, well, when he gets questioned, as does everybody at yeah. the church, he gets questioned, says he doesn't know anything about it, even though he's the last person to see her. And then he goes missing the next day. Nobody can find him. He didn't show up to the church. (laughs) So Dennis Curran, who was a charity worker at the church, he has got photographs of all the volunteers for ID and, you know, just... I suppose there was a valid reason. Top trumps. Yeah. And uh, he he gets the photograph. The police ask for it. They take the unusual step of putting it on the local news at 3 o'clock in the afternoon saying we're looking for this man, Pat McLaughlin... It goes on the national news at six o'clock. Now, Debbie sees this picture and she phones the police and she says, that's not Pat McLaughlin, that's Peter Tobin, and this is what I know about him. Wow. He checks, he's, he's gone far away, he's legged it to London, and he's checked into hospital as a, a James Kelly, and one of the nurses recognised him in there as well. And don't, he was, you, don't you think it's mad, right? Because, like... That was the time when everyone was still watching the news. I don't think most people watch the news now. Well, sort of, it's a generational thing, isn't it? Like, I yeah. would never sit down and... It's, I'd look at the news on my thing, but I'd never seen missing people. No. So, you know, because it would be like, you know, if you put... Of yesteryear, if you put something out in the evening papers, fucking everyone would see it. Or if you put something out on the 10 o'clock or 6 o'clock news, everyone would see yeah. it. But it must be much harder now to get the word out. But I guess... Things like social media, people will see stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Unless, I, yeah. I still watch... If I'm not on my way somewhere to a gig or I'm not away from home, I always watch the lunchtime news. Do you? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't okay. have a telly, do I? I but I guess it. I see stuff on Twitter being... I mean, sorry to bring it up, mate. But uh, of being retweeted. <laughs> Should we tell them what happened? You can tell them what happened right? and try not to get fucking angry. I've been banned from Twitter for having an interaction with friend of the show Will Duggan... Where cyberbullying, some would say. Fuck off! It's cyberbullying. Where like, where he sent me a message and I said, "Are you pissed?" And he said, "Stone, stone old sober baby." And I said, "Obviously you are." And he told me to shut up or something. And I can't remember what I said, 
But all I said was... You said, I will kill I will, you with my fair hands. I will kill you with my own fair hands. Some troll account, some incel, because they always are, an incel. Uh, in fact, if any incels listen to this, stop. Obviously saw this. Do I got, really think they would... They could bear to listen to two women having a conversation. Uh, <laughs> like the definition yeah, of a because, best style test. I guess actually not because that, because we are talking than, about men all the time. Yeah, <laughs> there's nothing better than an angry wank, is there? <laughs> so I wrote this. Twitter have banned me. They won't accept any of my appeals. Apparently, apparently it's threatening behaviour. It's absolutely disgusting. I it's saw a joke. Um, someone else he kicked off who had said to like their mate, "I'm going to come over there and stab you with a Cheeto," which is like a what's it, isn't it? And he's getting them, but it's just yeah, it's a troll account basically, and he's just for a laugh. It's doing the, it. It's the bloody mindedness of Twitter to be so no about this. Yeah, that they're refusing to recognise any kind of nuance. But again, that that's difficult for them. I, I, I think it's really clear in your case, but, you know, when they're, like, someone makes a threat and be like, what, that's a friend. Like, we all speak to each other well, like let that. Well, and... let me, as somebody who's never violated any rules, let me delete that tweet. Yeah, definitely. And let me carry on and pussyfoot around it for the rest of my Twitter life because that's what I'll end up doing. Can't say this, can't do that. Yeah, the stuff on Twitter, people just getting the dicks out. Yeah. Well, like, how many of our friends are... You know, threatened with rape or, exactly. you know, like, just the most horrific thing on a daily basis of being, like, a woman with visibility on the internet. And, yeah, and then you're told off for saying to Will Duggan that you're killing with your fair hands yeah. as well. Yeah. Clearly a joke. I tell you what I don't miss. Uh, men explaining every joke that I make on there. That's been refreshing. <laughs> yeah! Anyway. What was it? Right. I, 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 so I wrote something the other day. I did a, did a little joke. A picture, a visual joke. And... Somebody wrote underneath the exact thing that the joke was meant to be. Either you're that... Are you that fucking stupid or that patronising or both? And it's... I love men, don't get me wrong. All my mistakes in my life have been with men. <laughs> I fucking love men too much. But I have a word, some of you. Um, there's a really good Twitter account, I think it's called That's The Joke, that just, you know, because when you, you know, you go like... Whatever you say, um... Oh, I'm going to go to the gym later, or at least that's what I tell myself, or something like that. I mean, obviously I'm freestyling it, it's yeah, not that's... great. <laughs> and they go, um, lol, I bet you don't end up going, I bet you just say it. And it's like, yes, I mean, that's literally what I'm saying with that. So there's a Twitter account now that retweets all that stuff, called, uh, yeah, that's the joke. Just grind you down. And don't start tweeting in same attacking men, because I'm not. As I say. They can't tweet you, mate. You're off. As I say, I think it's well documented that I love men. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. And that isn't a come on, either. What do you mean? I don't know. I've had enough. Anyway, back to this. Who are you getting angry at now? Oh, I'm angry with plenty of people. <laughs> I've had enough this past two weeks. So he's hiding in a hospital yes. under a fake name. Yeah, with his fictitious complaint because there was bugger all wrong with him. Yeah, and so thankfully that nurse recognises him and he gets arrested. Mm-hmm. Now it goes to trial. It's about six weeks, this trial. It's at the High Court of Justiciary in Edinburgh. So it lasts from uh, the 23rd of March to the 4th of May 2007. It's Judge Lord Menzies. He, I hate this, Tobin said, oh, uh, no, this was all consensual. Yeah. She wanted to fuck me. Yeah, yeah. I hate it when they I mean, deny that it was sexual assault and they're like, no, no, she wanted to fuck me. And it's like, I mean, we can just take a basic look at this and know that that isn't yeah, true. Exactly. A, it's massively disrespectful. And, like, obviously he's lying. But come on, mate. Yeah. I mean, it's he's been horrific enough to already, like, don't try and make us all believe that she wanted to fuck you. That's just... Yeah, bullshit. So he gets found guilty of rape and murder and he's sentenced to 21 years and the judge describes him as an evil man. Mm -hmm. Fair comment. Now, after this, this conviction, David Swindles, who's one of the um, chief sort of... Detectives. Yeah. One of the big guys. (laughs) You know what I mean. Uh... (laughs) He's uh, one of the big guys. You know what? Who knows what I mean? I think being ill is take, taking it out of me. <laughs> I've had, I'm absolutely shattered. So he sets up. I mean, this there is some great policing in this. I think David Swindles was very good because he this thing he thinks. Hang on, Tobin's committed this crime. There's no way 
that this is the only crime that he's committed. And he sets up a task force called Operation Anagram, and this is nationwide. And it's about police looking at where Tobin has been throughout the country because he's very transient and seeing what crimes could possibly be linked to him. This is set up in June 2007. This is where we come to Vicky Hamilton. Yeah, so they search his old house. So Vicky Hamilton was 15 years old when she went missing. She was last seen at a bus stop. When will you learn? Do not wait at bus stops. In Reading, which is near Falkirk, on the 10th of February 1991. So all this time this has been an unsolved murder. Yeah. She was last seen eating chips on a bench, which is a sentence I believe that someone will one day say about me. I think that... Or, um... What's my, I, I think mine would be uh, arguing with a barman <laughs> or something. Last seen asking, excuse me, what are the vegan options? <laughs> and then looking sad. <laughs> That's going to be mine. Jesus. So she'd been staying at sister's, hadn't she? And she had to change in Bathgate to get her coach back home to... Was it... Uh, Paisley, I think it might have been. She had to change coaches anyway. And she was last seen in Bathgate. Now, this... Her parents, as soon as she doesn't come home where she's meant to, they're instantly worried because he's very unlike her. They know deep down something bad has happened. So they contacted the police and it led to one of the biggest missing persons investigations in Scottish history. Tobin is questioned about this disappearance because he was in Bathgate at the time that she went missing... And he actually moves to Margate just a couple of weeks after her disappearance. It's days. He fucks it's off days. days. Yeah, Days after. Days later. So on July the 21st, 2007, to- uh, well, someone is arrested and charged. Now, they didn't reveal who. Police decide to... Uh, they get permission to search one of his old houses in Bathgate, which was Robertson Avenue. And in the attic of the roof joist, in the root, one of the roof joists, they find a knife. All the evidence they had was a purse that belonged to Vicky that was found absolutely miles away um, from where she was last seen. And they did. that's all that they had. They didn't have anything else. There was DNA on it, though, there wasn't was there? DNA, but they didn't have a match for but it. they didn't have any match. So they re-examined the purse after they found the, the knife, and they found that on the purse there was DNA that didn't match Tobin, but it matched his son, who was three years old at the time that Vicky had gone missing, and they think what happened was they, Tobin had given him the purse to play with, and then it had just got lost as they're going That's about their so business. weird, it's isn't so it? So dark, isn't it? So dark. They search, the knife that they found uh, during the search, they found skin on it that matched Vicky, and Tobin was then interviewed uh, about Vicky. He actually admitted having a knife that was very similar to one that they'd found, and then when he realised why they were asking that, he sort of backtracked and he panicked and he became aggressive and he just wouldn't admit anything. He said he'd never met Vicky, he didn't know anything about her and he hadn't murdered her. Now, obviously, at this point, they have got enough evidence to charge him with her abduction and they think what happened is it's very likely that Vicky maybe saw Tobin and asked him for directions and she just picked the wrong person to ask. So the 21st of July 2007, he's charged with Vicky's abduction but obviously they don't have anybody either and this is where we end up going to 50 Irvine Drive in Margate. So, the on the 14th of November, the police confirm that they find human remains in the back garden. Now, Tobin, when he moved down to... I think it was when he moved to Portsmouth, he got work working for the uh, water department digging trenches, and he was trained to do it very efficiently. So he was digging in the back garden a sand pit, wasn't he, for yes. Daniel? So he's his neighbour... He wasn't actually digging a sandpit. So his neighbour pops over the fence. Because he's described Tobin as quite a jolly neighbour. He gets on with people. He, um, you know, he, he has conversations with them. This chap that was on a documentary said, oh, we used to lend each other power tools and we'd sit on the front step and we'd have a chat. And, yeah, he was quite a pleasant chap. And one day he pops his head over the fence and he says, uh, Tobin didn't really do anything in the garden. He wasn't particularly interested in gardening, but particularly he's digging away. And he says, uh, oh... What are you doing there? You're going for Australia? <laughs> Great bants. <laughs> and uh, Tobin says, no, I'm digging a sandpit for my son. And a couple of nights later, he's filling the, the sandpit in and he says, oh, what are you filling it in for? Have you changed your mind? He says, oh, no, social workers have been around. And he said, they said it's very, very dangerous for Daniel to have a sandpit. So I'm filling it in. I remember when I was growing up... Um, 
And we always had like huge, I grew up on a farm, and we always had like a huge pile of sand. Have I told you this? Huge pile of sand around because like there was always building we're doing, so you need sand to make cement. And uh, yeah, there's always be like a huge, massive, like two tons or whatever of sand. So it's like having sand pits, and like I'd have mates come over and get really excited. But we also had four cats who were constantly (laughs) burying their own shit about two. So, so I'd always be like, no, 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 don't play in the sand, knowing that it was just basically a heap of cat shit with some sand sort of casually pushed oh, over God. the top. I, I've actually, I've never had a good experience in a sand pit because <laughs> we used to have them at my old school when I was like, yeah, you know, probably like six, seven. And the sand pit only ever came out like twice a year when it was a hot day. Uh, but every time they opened it, it was always full of wood lice. Oh, really? Yeah, because I think it was quite a damp sort of thing. It yeah. was covered up all year. And then these wood lice are just like, oh, God, leave us alone. And you just pick a story with wood lice crawling about in it. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. sound very nice. <laughs> that sounds like very much like, uh, you know, just a thing that happened in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone had like a sandpit full of wood uh, lice. Please do, uh, I'd say, tweet us. Yep, tweet tweet the old killer account if you remember uh, wood lice in sand pits. Hashtag Wood lice no, don't you dare do that. Pit. Don't hijack this into some fucking Jeremy Vine <laughs> afternoon phone in. Um, oh, we've got um, we've got Rachel from Manchester on there. What were your school memories? I'll be honest with you, it was just the wood lice in the sand pit. <laughs> <laughs> he's digging this thing that he claims to be a sand pit, and it's not for that. The reason he's digging that is because Operation Anagram has thrown something else up that links in with this. So they've noticed that uh, he was in... Uh, in the area when a girl, an 18 year old girl called Dinah McNichol uh, goes missing at a music festival. Uh, she was last seen on the 5th of August 1991 and she'd been to this music festival, she'd met uh, a chap there, she stayed on a bit longer than she anticipated and they decide to hitchhike home. Yeah, from Lip Hook in yeah. Hampshire, she's from Tillingham in Essex. So he drops uh, the, dri- the, what they call, the, what do you call them, the person who picked him up, the driver, uh, drops off her male companion first uh, somewhere along the m25 which is a fucking hell of a place to drop someone off on junction end of the m25 yeah. like you're on your own now mate see ya yeah yeah because it's yeah it's a massive ring road that goes around london and she's never seen again uh, and the only evidence that they've got when she's gone missing is regular cash withdrawals of 250 pounds have been taken out of diner's account uh, in uh, sussex which and hampshire and hampshire which of which tobin was in these areas at the exact times of these cash withdrawals, which is great policing. Really good for policing. Very good. Now, they have enough evidence then to search his old house in Margate. And uh, this is where the, the neighbour sort of says, oh, yeah, I did see him. He was digging a hole. He was digging a sand pit. Now, they're expecting to find Dinah McNichol's body. Mm-hmm. And so are Dinah's family as well, because on a couple of the documentaries, they're like, we knew something terrible had happened to her. We thought she was dead. We kind of wanted closure. In a way, we were hoping that we would get it when they're searching his house. So they find a body um, after a search. It wasn't Dinah. This was Vicky yeah. that they found. So 14th of November, they find human remains in the back garden of 50 Irvin Drive. Mm-hmm. So she was identified from her jewellery. And I hate to say this, but it was a horribly brutal murder. So she was murdered clearly in Bathgate. She was cut into two parts. Two, a body was put in 13 different plastic bags and because of the bags that were used, it actually preserved her body quite well, so mm. she was very easy to identify. Now, Tobin obviously drove this poor girl's body all the way down from Bathgate to Margate, which is like 500 miles. Jesus Christ. Um, it's just awful. That's, that's sort of like when I leave, a when I'm like, I'm going to take this to the charity shop and, I, and then it just gets driven around the yeah. country for ages. <laughs> Did he fucking forget she was in there? Or do you think he was deliberately moving her away from the area? Deliberately. Do you think? Yeah, of course, he deliberately did it. Blech. Of course. So he, um, a couple of, the search continues and this is when they find Dinah McNichol's body as mm. well. Um, now, 2009, June 2009, is the trial. He gets suspended because he's too ill. Yeah. Well, there was a month where he was uh, tried, it goes to the High Court in Dundee, and he says, I think this is for Vicky's, uh, he's two separate trials, I think, so Vicky's uh, murder, and he goes, no, it's coincidence, it's two houses, I happen to live in, I've got an alibi, that falls apart when they have forensic evidence, there's DNA, there's fingerprints on the dagger that was used to kill her, her purse has DNA of his son on it, the sheet that she was wrapped in has his DNA on it, so, um, 
yeah, obviously that's a done deal. He challenges the verdict, um, but then drops that challenge in March 2009. So in June 2009, the trial uh, starts, Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's postponed because he's got to have surgery. And then it starts again in December 2009 um, in Chelmsford. Now, his defence, the prosecution lays out their case for the murder of Dinah McNichol. The defence don't challenge it at all. They're just like, yep, they just don't even say anything. Um, So December the 16th, 2009, he is found guilty um, of his third life sentence. Took the jury less than 15 minutes, didn't it? That's fucking amazing, that. Someone's gone for a piss in that time as well. Done. Yeah, I'm just, I'm absolutely fucking busting for a piss, but obviously guilty. But and then just nicked out. Yeah, no, yeah, we've seen right. a sec. Is anyone want to from the vending machine? Are you allowed to vape in here? <laughs> um, and they said that life should be life because he's got yeah. three life sentences. He's not even allowed to apply for parole at all. So after this, other, these two other further convictions, they reopened Operation Anagram because it had been so successful. And they think he could be responsible for up to 13 unsolved murders around the UK, um, including, including Bible John. Yeah, because what the theory there is that the murders that he did were so kind of sophisticated that there's no way that that was his first murders. And because there's all this thing of, like, he used to go to, uh, what was it Barrowland. Barrowland. Yeah. He looked like uh, the EFIT. Yeah. Uh, he'd moved away from uh, Glasgow. He'd moved from Glasgow in 1969, the same year that the killings officially ended. The missing tooth. So eyewitnesses told police they had the suspects had a missing tooth in his upper right area. Dental records proved it, that Peter Tobin had a tooth removed around that area in the 1960s. Um, he reacted badly when his girlfriends were menstruating, something that happened in the Bible John murders. Mm. Um, there's no forensic evidence, though. See, I was in two minds because part of me was like, yeah, it's definitely him. And then another part of me was like, yeah, but if that policeman who's really good that set up Operation Anagram says he doesn't think it's Tobin. Is that what he said? Yeah, he said he doesn't think it's him. Well, he boasts in prison that he killed 48 yeah. people. Um, in fact, someone tried to kill him using napalm. Um, <laughs> yeah, who also is in the papers, like, literally this week for trying to kill someone else. In fact, he poured boiling water or sugar all over someone. Prison sounds like the fucking worst place, which I guess is the point of it. And it's hard because Bible John uh, DNA has been really badly stored and has deteriorated, so they can't test it. So you'll never know unless he he's confesses. Ne- he's never going to confess. Of course he won't confess. Have you seen the awful interviews with him? No. What a horrible little man. Really? Horrible. In yeah. what way? Uh, aggressive, violent, nasty defensive, just horrible. And, like, so unwilling to to sort of admit anything. Just so, like, no. Just constantly denying everything. Just no redeeming features. Just a piece of shit, innit? I get, yeah, but, like, well, not that I'm trying to provide, be like the BBC and provide endless balance, but, like, he... He has to... Like, there's no right way to behave. Everything you do is going to be... That's just my dog shaking. Mm. Everything you do is going to be perceived as... You know, yeah, he just admits it. He doesn't even say... You know, like... There's no good way to behave when it's when you murdered people, I guess. Yeah, but the the evidence of this man's history is just an utter shit. Sometimes people yeah. are just utter cunts and they have no redeeming feature whatsoever. He does seem, like, from the beginning, like a fucking yeah. asshole with how violent he was towards the women in his life and how manipulative and... Just even the, like, you know, there's some people who, who are backed into a corner and act poorly mm. um, through circumstances, but, like, I'm going to take this 17-year-old girl, I'm going to move her, yeah, you, you know, know exactly nine hours away from her yeah. family so she's got fucking no one on, I'm going to follow her to the car when she gets yeah. the shopping in. Like, that's not a good dude, is it? No. Yeah, no, he's not. horrific, and uh, he will die in prison. Yeah, no no parole, never getting out. Oh, it's now he's in his late se- mid-70s, I think? Yeah, he's old boy, yeah. Yeah, so... That is the fucking horrible fucking. Peter Tobin. <laughs> You've been texting me while we've been looking at this stuff, being like, this guy's a fucking prick. Re- honestly, I think of all the ones we've done, it's proper brought me down, this one. Yeah, it's horrible. Horrible. Because also what I said to you earlier is, like, some of the stuff you're reading about, what he did and what he got away with, it's like it's happening 200 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're like, oh, God, I guess they didn't have this to find that. But it's like, uh, you know what makes me really sad is, like, there are women in 2000, you know, in like 90s, 2000, 
living with men like or you know men living with women like this mm-hmm. as well but people living with people who fucking treat them like this is like it's just so sad that some people cannot know that there's anything better out there yeah yeah and I guess we all have that to like lesser and greater degrees in relationships we've been in but it's just fucking heartbreaking and I just always think as well with, with stuff like this it's when like someone you know there's a missing woman or a missing child and like for years and years and years of families had to go through the agony of like not knowing knowing some awful's happened yeah but not knowing the actual facts of what happened and there's one person that fucking knows and they can sit there with no conscience well it's fucking and Keith Johnson isn't it on the morning I just I just can't yeah it's just horrible yeah that's, I mean we all know that Ian Brady's an absolute piece of shit well you found out an interesting fact about him didn't you yeah I was listening to a I was on my, you know, I was on a train journey yesterday, going to my gig, feeling terrible. So what did I do? I listened to a podcast about the Moors murders, and uh, apparently he used to like to. <laughs> it's not funner. He's like <laughs> having a candle put up his bum. <laughs> <laughs> it's so specific, isn't it? A candle, <laughs> like a finger. Doesn't it sound like a reflexology treatment? And be like, and we can have a, <laughs> you know, because you have those candles you put in your ears. The JML so. anus candle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Available from all good shops. <laughs> JMS fucking anus candle. That's funny. I just don't know. Like, That's what we should give out as presents at Christmas. The JML anus candle. What's it do? It, uh, what doesn't it do? That's yeah. what we need to ask. It's decorative. Yeah. It's medicinal. Yeah. It's... It can like burn the air off your sprouts, uh, sprout farts <laughs> straight away. Absolutely awful. Uh, yeah, I found that out, and it, I don't know, it spun me out a bit. I was like, it's a weird <laughs> spun fact. you out. It's just a weird fact to put in there about somebody. It, it is bizarre, no. yeah. Very odd. Not the weirdest thing he's done. But yeah, him <laughs> holding on to where they... I don't think he remembers where they buried Keith Bennett's body, but him holding on to that over poor Winnie Johnson, who died not knowing what happened to her. Well, she knew what happened to her son, but yeah. she never knew where he was. I think that kind of thing is just really torturous for families. It's horrible. Horrible, it just ruins... It's just lives ruined, isn't it? Yeah, forever. It's horrible, horrible. Um, so that is the grotesque Peter Tobin. Uh, we're going to try and get another one out to you soon for Halloween. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been umming and eyeing, but we think we might do... Jimmy Savile? Ed Gein, I thought. Sorry, I wasn't... I was... One of the two. Uh, see, this is what happens when I can't go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I'm missing furious. Like, uh, no, so I think we're going to do Ed Gein. Yeah, mm-hmm. oh, who is not technically a serial killer, but we'll get into that. Uh, we got went for him because you guys suggested on the Facebook page uh, that he is good because, uh, well, you were like, oh, what about doing a fictional one, which is great mm-hmm. idea, but he inspired at least three that I know. Yeah. Um, so we think he might be quite good to do. Thanks, everyone, for coming to the live shows. Uh, my, my suggestion for the, uh, for the fictional one was uh, what's it called Blackfish. She wants to do the fucking killer whale. Shamu, the killer whale. From Blackfish. He's had a terrible childhood, ripped away from the bosom of his mother, taken, kidnapped, in Sexually opinion, abused. Abused. Used. It was in the military for a bit. Yeah, abused. That poor fish, I'm telling you, murdered people, which I don't agree with. Things are... The mammal's a serial killer. I, I think I'll get really upset if I watch the programme about it. Oh, it's It's horrible. Made me furious. Really? Yeah, absolutely furious. I can't really... I to do. So I, I try my best to be kind of good with all this, like, not eating anything good. But, like, <laughs> it's... Uh, it, I don't know. I, I do bury my head in the sand with stuff. You know, like, people have watched Cowspiracy and stuff. I'm like, I just can't... I, I have to not nah, put myself I, through stuff like that. I found it very distressing. Ugh. Yeah. So that is Peter Tobin. Thanks to everyone who has come to see live shows, like Thank we said. You, yeah. uh, thanks to everyone who's buying tickets for our tour shows. Cause Rachel's doing hers in the Frog and Bucket very yeah. soon. See you next week. Yeah, nearly sold it out. Shit. Right? Um, yeah, and uh, I'm on tour in the spring. Exactly. I've got my London... Well, I'll go and bloody everywhere. It's all on my website if you'd like to come and see the show that I did in Edinburgh, if you haven't seen it, called Victim Complex. That'd be nice. No press, obviously. Oh, and someone tweeted me the other day saying, um, uh, I just sat next to you on the bus uh, when I had an old killer tote and I didn't say anything. Say something! Because then I'll know to stop slagging... <laughs> and telling very indiscreet stories loudly on a bus about him uh, so yeah um, please don't be afraid to say hello 
Um, yeah, I, I love it. She it fucking good. loves it. She's like, just been recognised again, mate. Love it, mate. Yeah, Rachel lives for it. I get quite shy because I'm always worried about how, uh, oh, God, I look like shit, like I've not got any oh, makeup on. I often worry, how pissed am I? <laughs> That's always at the forefront of my mind. Uh, I've been very good recently. Can't get the pub today, can I? Well, I can actually. I'm going in a minute. You're literally going in a second. <laughs> Classic Yay. fair bird. <laughs> Classic fair child, that. <laughs> Wild child. Here she is. Nice, nice, very good. It was quite neat, that, innit? A little oh, bow excellent. on it. Uh, thank that. you so much for listening. I will speak to you soon. Bye.